York Southern Tina Bay's uh, lifeguard 800 heavy, 8,200 climbing 1, 1,000. We just saw an explosion out here, it's going to be 507. It's going to be 507, I'm sorry I missed it. Uh, you're out of 18, did you say something else? We just saw an explosion of the heavy, there's someone about, about 16,000 feet or something like that, it just went down to the water. Most of the urges are doing on, I could confirm that out of my, not at, say, my 9 o'clock position, we just had an, like an explosion out there, about five miles away, six miles away. CWA 800 center. CWA 800 center. I think that was him. I think so. I'll go out. And we saw two fireballs go down into the water. On July 17, 1996, TWA Flight 800 exploded in the sky. A missile, or some kind of streaking object, was seen in the sky at the same time TWA Flight 800 exploded. I saw an object rise out of the ocean. It was moving very rapidly. And then start climbing, passing my altitude, and the explosion. And the very next day, the FBI came to talk to me and said, you did not see that, you saw nothing. The TWA Flight 800 in-flight breakup was initiated by a fuel air explosion in the center wing tank. We didn't find any part of the airplane that indicated a mechanical failure. The explosive forces came from outside the airplane, not the center fuel tank. The FBI did all the interviewing of eyewitnesses. No witness was ever allowed to testify. For that kind of cover-up to be tolerated, it makes me fighting mad. <laughs> Broadcasting live from the dark and cold dungeons deep beneath the KLAV studios in Las Vegas, Nevada. Prepare yourselves to be taken away into another dimension as we now have control over your thoughts, fears, and perspective of the unexplained world you dare not speak of. With your hosts, Lindsay Knight and Michael Knight. Ladies and gentlemen, we now open the gates to the paranormal and beyond. 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 Broadcasting live from the KLAV studios in Las Vegas, Nevada, this is the Paranormal and Beyond. In the evening of July 17, 1996, TWA Flight 800 carrying a total of 212 passengers, including 18 crew members, was on its routine flight to Paris, were on takeoff and only 11 minutes into its climb, exploded in midair and killing all 230 souls aboard. As the government of the United States, despite the embarrassment of having been caught in rigging court lab tests and lying in all of its reports, still to this day, they officially blame the disaster solely to a spark in the center fuel tank while insisting that the 670 eyewitnesses who saw a missile hit the jumbo jet were all delusional. When we return, what really happened to Flight 800? And also, what is the government so desperately trying to hide? In a moment, the story, the investigation, the eyewitness reports, the evidence, and the conspiracy when we return right here on the Talk of Las Vegas, KLAV 1230 AM. Your ticket to the unknown is at Knights Paranormal Research Society.com. UFOs, ghosts, aliens, hauntings. Mysterious places and more can be found at Knights Paranormal Research Society.com. Knights with a K Paranormal Research Society.com. Based out of Las Vegas, Nevada, Knights Paranormal Research Society is owned and operated by the renowned brother and sister team of Michael and Lindsay Knight. Seeing is believing. And at Knights Paranormal Research Society.com, you're going to believe.
Join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight, for the paranormal and beyond. Join host Michael Knight and Lindsay Knight as they investigate the unexplained and most controversial mysteries of the world. The paranormal and beyond, where the paranormal lives on and conspiracies exposed. The paranormal and beyond, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight. Brought to you by Knight's Paranormal Research Society.com. She packed my bags last night, we fly Zero hour, 9 a.m. And I'm gonna be high as a kite by then. Welcome back to this brand new edition of the Paranormal Beyond. But first, be sure to check us out at Night's Paranormal Research Society.com where you can link up to all the past shows by simply clicking on that archive link above. That's Night's Paranormal Research Society.com. Interested in acting? We'll start acting by logging on to Hollywood Bound Acting Academy.com. Once again, that's Hollywood Bound Acting Academy. Dot com. Special shout out to all those listening to us online through the KLAV 1230AM.com website and all those driving around in the Vegas Valley listening to us on your stereos. All right, we got a very, very sort of like tragic show. Once again, another cover up and so blatantly in the face of people. We're going to get into uh, TWA Flight 8, 800 and everything about it to this day you have a lot of people who's pointing at conspiracies. I don't think it's a conspiracy due to all the information out there. How are you doing, Lindsay? I'm well, thank you. And I, you know, I can't wait to do this story because I, I pretty much want to blow the cover on well, what really happened on this TWA flight 800. Well, that's what we do. Uh, the evidence alone is compelling. This happened in 1996 and back then there's still control when it comes to our government and it just like really really fires me up that this is going on and a lot of people out there don't even realize the magnitude of what our government is doing now today they say oh there's a government shutdown shut them down completely i say but once again that's just another ploy for them to rebuild again the way they want to and it's all just one big cover-up but let's get into the news. Topping the news for the paranormal and beyond this Wednesday, September 25th, a woman admitted she convinced her husband to attack her neighbor, who she said telepathically raped her. That's right. Melanie Selenet, 55, of Centerville, Utah, pleaded guilty last week to charges of attempted criminal solicitation and possession of a dangerous weapon by a restricted person. Court documents obtained by both papers show that Melanie Selenet convinced her husband that Pierce had telepathically raped her on several occasions. Melanie had told her husband, Mr. Selenet, to go ahead and shoot Mr. Pierce, according to Melanie Selenet's arrest warrant. The defendant also admitted that immediately before the shooting, as Mr. Selenet stood at the door of his trailer preparing to shoot Mr. Pierce, Melanie told her husband to go for it. The victim's injuries were not life-threatening. Melanie Selenet will be sentenced next month. If that wasn't paranormal enough, now get this. A woman who hosted a French exchange student 10 years ago and recently let him move back in was allegedly attacked by the man. Police said Pierre Franchi, 29, attacked 66-year-old Sue Ann Montfort in the early Friday morning because demons were after her. In an attack that lasted for nearly 10 hours, Franchi allegedly shouted, Demons are coming after you, as he repeatedly choked and assaulted Montfort. Using cords from the blinds in her bedroom, Franchi allegedly choked her before grabbing a pillow, attempting to smother her. He then hit her over the head with a handheld mirror. I have to protect you, Franchi told her. I have to kill the demons. Franchi allegedly broke Monfort's cell phone at the time of the attack. Afraid she would call for help, fighting off the man, Monfort fell to the floor, who Franchi ordered her to bow to him. 
Monfort's escape to the bathroom, where she stayed for hours. When she attempted to yell for help through a window, Franchi blared the music to drown her out. Franchi eventually left, allegedly stealing the woman's car and purse before being apprehended by police. That night, Monfort confronted Franchi over a wet towel over a chair, which prompted an hour-long argument before she went to bed. Three hours later, he allegedly attacked her. Franchi is currently being held at the Palm Beach County Jail. He faces charges including aggravated battery of a person over 65, false imprisonment, grand theft, and depriving use of 911. Late Monday, he remained behind bars in lieu of $30,000 bail. Sh- now, <laughs> if, if that's not crazy enough, I mean, come on. Reporting the news for the paranormal and beyond, this is Lindsay Knight. That is strange and bizarre. Well, I can understand the... Uh telepathically raping somebody. I think a lot of men do that in their heads. I mean, what but is this I, world coming to? <laughs> but getting, uh, but actually, you know, convincing somebody that that's actually happening and about to commit murder and end somebody's life for that is, is very out there. You know, it's just crazy. And the whole demon thing, yes, there's a lot of people possessed out there. I believe that one. Hmm. All right, let's get into Flight 800, and this story's been around since 1996. I mean, it all started when, you know, pieces aren't matching together, and the sad thing about this, you know, the mourning the families have to go through, especially all 230 people who died, 212 people, passengers, and then you had 18 crew members who died on this flight. There's really no closure to this. The reason why is because of this conspiracy. You always hear about it. It's always coming up, and they can't lay to rest because you have on YouTube, you have on TV news shows, and you, you know, enlightenment evidence coming up that this was not the way the FBI, and I'm not even saying the NTSB at this point, it was the FBI and CIA who put out made it the way it was supposed to be well what 17 years later and you know there is a movie that actually just came out uh the conspiracy of twa flight 800 so uh, obviously the families cannot you know rest because and the reason why i say that these you know this story story keeps on coming up is because obviously there's something that's not right well there's no closure to it so that's why i feel sorry for the family members who lost their loved ones on this flight it it was ill-fated when we talk about the story, talk about coincidence being at the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, and all that. But like I said, once you don't tell the truth in anything, you tend to lie more and more and more to cover up, you know, past lies. And it just snowballs where you don't get that closure. If they would have just came out and told the truth, hey, it was an accident of an accident, then therefore we can move on and you know, suffer the repercussions on what happens next after that. Well, you always hear about a lot of airplanes, you know, especially like Boeings who have pretty much. Well, crashed. Crashed and blown up. And it's always, you know, the cause is you well, know yeah, something it, in the plane. But this particular story, you know, with this TW flight 800, you know, in 1996 just won't die. And well, the, there's too many holes in the story. And to this day, there's a lot of questions that arises. And, not only that, there's now six NTSB investigators who were at the case at 1996 that are now coming forward and telling what really happened. And we're talking about whistleblowers okay, here, Okay, the and way. these guys are blowing the whistle big time. And they're doing it not for their own fame or to make money. It's to give the family rest and close the door on this chapter because these people weren't supposed to die, all right? Let me ask you a question. Did these family members get compensated? I have no idea. They they probably did, but it's nothing compared to losing a loved one. Any amount of money you get is not compared to losing a loved one and not getting the full answers and then finding out that something deeper, more could be involved in this. It's basically a slap in the face. It's like, here's your money. Now get out of here. Now let's let's actually go back to July 17th, 1996. All right, let's take you through the actual day, all right? We're talking now JFK International Airport. This is a congested airport. During the time of the 17th, 1996, very high security alert at this time. All right, the airport is packed. They're expecting about a 1,000 flights to depart this airport. And the reason why of the height alert during that time is because in Manhattan, that's only just down, basically down the street, in the federal court, they were trying Ramsey Youssef. If you all remember this, this was the guy who bombed the Trade Center and took 6,000 
thousand kilotons of explosives and put them in a truck and bombed the bottom. We all remember that. This what was that attempt. What a coincidence. Okay. So they're trying this guy in Manhattan at the Superior Federal Court at the same time on this morning. And not only that, there's reports that this guy had intentions to kill innocent civilians by using 12 jetliners. So everybody was on high alert. And the airport, of course, was on high alert. The FBI knew about this and was very aware of this. All right, now let's fast forward because the afternoon. At 4.31 p.m., the Boeing 747 landed in JFK and then changed its call sign to TWA 800 and was getting ready for its routine flight to Paris, which was going to embark at 7 o'clock sharp out of JFK. When the plane touched down, all right, ground crews, you know, went to his gate. It got ready. Ground crews uh, filled the plane up with uh, 16,000 liters of jet A-grade fuel. And this plane was ready to go. Fasten seatbelts, all that. Get the plane prepped. During this time now, as passengers were arriving at the airport to catch this flight 800, the airport was, you know, busy. We're talking about JFK. The flight was so packed that they already were going to bump people. Have you went to the airport and they they speak on the intercom? If you're willing to give up your seat, we're going to compensate you money. So there was a lot of people. So you're saying that this flight was at max capacity, 212 people, not including the 18 people that were the crew members. Yeah, this flight was topped off, all right? And they were even going to pay off people to take a later flight, give them a free hotel or money on top of this. And a lot of people were going to take that thing because they needed money you know you wouldn't catch a later flight you know sad to say that i would <laughs> well see you wouldn't know that and that's the whole thing that when fate comes knocking on your door you never know when's your last breath right. you know and, and let's talk about the people who are going on this flight you had 17 high school students going to paris for their field trip all right you had people, not only that, you have a lot of crew members, family members going to Paris well, I thought to go backpacking, hiking. You're talking about Paris. This is vacation time. Well, it, it was actually destined for Italy, Rome, Italy, but it was a layover in um, Paris. No, they were going to Paris, basically Paris. Okay. That was their final destination in this. And talking about final destination, this is how the <laughs> movie Final Destination got their premise. Remember, it was called Flight 180. They were oh, going to yeah. call it Flight 800, but it was just too much. And remember, they were all leaving New York. To go to Europe. Yeah, to go to Paris. That. And it blew up in midair. And that's a little fact I want to throw out there. FYI, that that's how they got that premise for Final Destination. But so you had all these people that were getting on this flight and people who were flying to Paris for their first time. We're not flying inside the united states so you know we do that's not a big thing but going to another you know country continent you know you're going to europe it's vacation time right oh yeah so everybody was happy so around 6 p.m now you had the 212 you know ill-fated passengers board twa 800 so imagine yourself boarding you're happy and put yourself and just close your eyes and listen to what i'm saying all right put you in the motion because when i researched this i had like tears coming down because it's just so sad and then having to listen to the flight data recorder and and just everything it's just shocking all right so everybody's getting ready and they're scheduled to depart at 7 p.m in charge of the flight crew was captain steven schneider all right he had over 4700 hours of flight time within 747 so he was well qualified and was a creme de la creme when it comes to pilot and twa's whole hierarchy or pilots beside him was co-pilot ralph kevorkin all right not kevorkin kevorkin he himself was also a veteran of TWA. We had very sophisticated pilots. These weren't rookies who were in charge of a 747. Now we're talking about a 747, which is, at the time, the biggest ever jetliner produced in the world. All right, This is the double-decker plane that we all see. A lot of people ride 737s right. today. No, these are the 747s like you see Virgin Air, the big ones with the quad engines, the four engines. Okay, now uh, let's fast forward to 7 o'clock. Captain Schneider and the whole crew already are prepped. Everybody's in their seat and ready to go. All right, they're a little bit behind. They're supposed to take off, but we all know there's delays. 
However, they get a they get they get a call from the gate and saying that a passenger is not on board the manifesto. It's terrible. That's terrible. Okay, a passenger's not on board. So what happens because of the new federal regulations, if you guys ever board a plane today and they're frantically looking for somebody and they can't take off, it's because there's a law passed and they can't just take off and leave somebody behind no more. That they can't do that. They can if this person does not have their baggage checked in the cargo hold of the flight. Although this person did this have person their cargo. had the yes. cargo that was inside the flight. However, this passenger was not there. It was a vacant seat. All right. So this is the reason why TWA 800 got delayed on the tarmac and didn't do its taxi yet. All right. And here's the reason why they passed this law because in 1998, remember Pan Am 103 that exploded over the air over the town of Lockerbie and Scotland. This was due because a terrorist checked his bag in and it went on the plane, but he never boarded. Really? They found out because of this, you know, the plane exploded. And this is the famous Pan Am plane that went down, killed 108 people. That was the incident that changed regulations. And to this day, they cannot take off any airport if there's baggage. That's why you see them running around. But that was in 1998. Huh? That was in 1998? Well, when? Yeah. Okay. 1998. All right. Am I lost here? Yes, because you said in 1996. Oh, 19, 1988. Okay. Excuse me. All right. <laughs> I was like, well, all we right, went yeah. to the future. All right. <laughs> 1988, this happened. So because of this regulation change today, we all know that we're sitting there and we're like getting delayed. It's because somebody has their bag checked and they're waiting for the passengers to come. That's why they leave the gate door open. Okay. What happened from ground control, they get a call. And it goes right to Captain Schneider, and it's the gate and saying, you know, we're sorry, this person's been on board the whole time. It was their mix-up. And they found this person who was missing on board the whole entire time. So now, 759, air traffic control in the tower contacts TWA 800 to make its taxi. So they're clear for takeoff, and we're talking about one hour later. Yeah. It makes them it makes them clear clear for their taxi to go. So they proceed down the runway and ready to go. All right. 819. This is when air traffic control actually gives them the go ahead, you know. So they gave them for per- permission to take off off runway 22 right. 11 minutes into their flight climb is when the most catastrophic thing happened. All right, the last thing air flight controllers heard was they're okay for their climb. They asked permission and said, go ahead, climb. And they're roughly around 13,000 feet on their climb. And we're talking right there that quick, you know, lives were lost. So let's play a clip of the actual air traffic controller. Hey, look, to the base, uh, lifeguard 800 heavy, 8,200 climbing, 11,000. We just saw an explosion out here, it's going to be 507. Five oh seven. I'm sorry, I missed it. Uh, you had eighteen. Did you say something else? Oh, we just saw an explosion by Everest. There's someone about it's about sixteen thousand feet or something like that. It just went down to the water. Oh, so I just heard there nine. I could confirm that out of my nine, uh, three, my nine o'clock position. We just had an ex- looked like an explosion out there, about five miles away, six miles away. Virgin 009, I'm sorry, you transmitted. Hurricane 19, handoff, please. Uh, uh, the 9 o'clock position, sir, it looked like an explosion of some sort, about maybe six to five, six miles out from my 9 o'clock position. An explosion six miles out at your 9 o'clock position, thank you very much, sir. Contact New York Approach 125.7. Uh, yes, sir, it blew up in the air, and then we saw two fireballs go down to the, to the water, there's a big small, uh, smoke from a coming up from that. Also, uh, there seemed to be a light, I thought it was a landing light on, it was coming right at us at about, about oh, 15,000 feet or something like that, and I put my landing light to, you know, so I saw them, and then it blew. TWA 800 center. TWA 800 center. I think that was him. I think so. I'll go up. All right, that that is sad to listen, all right? And, and if you heard a vital piece of information within the recording of that, okay, 
the recordings are by other aircraft in the area who are reporting this to air traffic control, which is at JFK and what they see. These guys are basically there seeing this throughout their cockpit window and it's unfolding out. You have three different aircrafts who are reporting back. All right. And, and it was so quick because the last transformation, not transformation, but the response from 800, which was called by air traffic control, TW 800 lifeguard was asking permission to climb. And five seconds later, this explosion happened. All right. There's one vital smoking gun piece of information. If you didn't catch it, I will tell you at the end of the show why I suspect it was a missile. So now after you've heard that, that's what happened. And, and that's history. Now there's a lot of investigations coming on. All right. First report on the scene was Coast Guard that night. It was still a little bit light out, but we had the Coast Guard who scrambled because we had a veteran helicopter chopper pilot who was working for the Coast Guard doing a training mission who, where this plane literally exploded above him. All right, He had to do an evasive maneuver to get out of the way because imagine a, a shrapnel hitting the, the rotor blades. He would crash and it would take him out too. So he took off. He re- immediately went back to Coast Guard to the landing heliport and had another thing and said, oh, my God, there's an explosion. During this time, we are re- FBI already gets word about this explosion, already CIA. And and the only, this is what gets me. The only people who actually responded for the helping that night was the Coast Guard. All right? Think about that. It was the Coast Guard. When there is a plane crash of this magnitude, okay, pretty much. And l- let me just tell you where it exploded. It actually exploded on the Atlantic Ocean near Long Island. So it didn't crash down on any homes or any buildings or whatnot. But obviously everybody lost their lives, 230 people. Exactly. In this well, tragic event. Well, its flight path was going through the most congested part to go to Paris. Not only that, it was going to skim past a uh, a no-fly zone, which military was, you know, their their area for testing whatever they tested. And it was known during that night that there was a live test. And we'll get that to that later. Right now we're going to concentrate on what they spoon-fed everybody and everybody – that our sheeple believes what happened, all right? Well, now, again, like when I was saying, when um, stuff like this happens, okay, the first on the scene normally, besides the Coast Guard, should be... Should be everybody. A- any any vessel, whether it's commercial or, or not, the police, everybody gets involved. I, we're talking about potential survivors here. You know, you drop everything, and this is... This is what they do. I mean, this is in their manual. If there's a big catastrophe, especially, especially a plane crash that is heavy. You know when you see a plane and you know what that red flashing light means? It means passenger heavy. So if you see a plane in the air and you see that flashing light, it means there are passengers on board. A lot of people don't know that. Every time I look up now, I'm going to look for yeah. that light. Well, <laughs> that's the whole thing, you know, that there, there's codes and lights of airplanes and aviation. However, the only people who came to the rescue was maybe a couple police vessels at the time, but the U.S. Coast Guard. All right. It was hard. Can you imagine the scene? By the time they got there, we're talking about a 10-mile radius in the water with debris everywhere and 11 feet flame shooting up. And at this time, it's dark. All right. Any any chance of finding any survivors at this point grim. and especially at their altitude that they were at at 13,000 feet plummeting to the ocean floor th- there's probably no chance all right it took a while the next day that's when we had the FBI come on the scene the NTSB National National Transportation Safety Board came on the scene as well then at this time then you had few Navy vessels who were going to come and help. It was grim. You know, there's pieces scattered out everywhere. And, I mean, bodies, I think 79 bodies recovered only. And a lot of them were charred and unrecognizable. And some basically were ejected of the explosion and were alive, falling to their death, 13,000 feet. That's I That's terrible. Think about it. it. Just It's the worst thought. You know, rec- like I said, researching this, 
it's just too much. However, any any hope that parents had when they heard of their flight, I mean, they woke up the next day, and this is where a lot of people actually heard, you know, that their family members were on this ill-fated flight, lost all hope. When they seen the helicopter views and just the wreckage itself, it, it was gone. So basically, they wanted to know why. We're going to take a quick break and come back and pretty much try to piece together what they spoon fed us and then go through the conspiracy theory that right now is probably plausible and hardcore fact when we return to the Bar Paranormal Beyond right here on the Talk of Las Vegas, KLV 1230 AM. You're listening to the Paranormal and Beyond. Join us at 731-1230. Lindsay and Michael return after these brief messages. Your ticket to the unknown is at nightsparanormalresearchsociety.com. UFOs, ghosts, aliens, hauntings. Mysterious places and more can be found at nightsparanormalresearchsociety.com. Nights with a K, paranormalresearchsociety.com. Based out of Las Vegas, Nevada, Nights Paranormal Research Society is owned and operated by the renowned brother and sister team of Michael and Lindsay Knight. Seeing is believing. And at nightsparanormalresearchsociety.com, you're going to believe. Join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight, for the paranormal and beyond. Join host Michael Knight and Lindsay Knight as they investigate the unexplained and most controversial mysteries of the world. The paranormal and beyond, where the paranormal lives on and conspiracies exposed. The paranormal and beyond, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight. Brought to you by Knight's Paranormal Research Society.com. You are now in the mix with the Paranormal Beyond, only on KLAB, 1.30 a.m. All right, welcome back to the Paranormal Beyond. If you're just tuning in, we are talking about the TWA Flight 800 Conspiracy. But first, remember to check us out at nightsparanormalresearchsociety.com and catch up to all the missed shows and listen to them all over again to your listening pleasure. Also, if you have a topic that you would like to hear on future episodes of the Paranormal Beyond, be sure to drop us an email at theparanormalandbeyond at yahoo.com. All right, let's get into now the investigation on what they basically told us. And I'm not talking about the NTSB. These guys were told to be quiet and not do nothing. You, you would think this is the NTSB. This is what they're trained to do. However, when the FBI came in, they were told to step back. They got this. And then you had ATF come down. All right. Why is ATF there? Okay, maybe because of that whole, you know... Yeah, Yousef. Yeah, situation. But now it's weird, okay? So they take over this and they come. You have 670 eyewitnesses that were talking what they seen, but they didn't want to hear it. They did not want to hear it. So they have this big inquiry, you know, it's just like the 9-11 commission hearing and everything about this. Instead of hearing these decorated, you have government officials who actually witnessed something they're professional scientists. They went and did their own thing. There's a lot of shady things going around when they were investigating this. All right. Stuff was missing. Evidence was missing. But yet they stuck to their guns and came up with this theory that the middle tank of Flight 800 caused the spark and exploded in midair. All right. They went as far as doing this whole propaganda piece and made the CIA put out this video that was aired all over the world on every network. And it was this cartoony video of the flight, you know, getting exploding 
and the nose falling off and climbing. And basically, that's it. And Bob's your uncle. Okay. Basically. So normally, when something like this happens and there is a plane crash, um, the NTSB comes in and they're the one who does, does the initial investigation, right? Yes. Now, the FBI, you said, came in the next day. How long before they told the N- NTSB to, you know what, take a step back, let us handle this? And when did the CIA This is come right in? from the get-go. Right from I the mean, get-go. right when the, they told them to step back. They took over the investigation. And it, that, that seems already odd that the FBI automatically steps in. Well, here's the thing. Okay, as they took over the investigation, they started scrapping all the material and getting them off the ocean, as well as the dead bodies. And you had, this was in conjunction with the Coast Guard and and the FBI and ATF and all those governments that we don't like to talk about, all right? They started getting all the wreckage and started putting this in a hangar and trying to figure out what really happened. They assembled everything together and basically came to the conclusion and basically shut the case down without these investigators, the NTSB, are saying, no, there's a lot of evidence pointing to explosive material and powders being found here and how can this and you had veteran TWA pilots saying this is unprobable we're talking about the commercial airliner the TWA 800 which exploded 25 years old who've had more than 14,000 flights not hours flights under its belt and the pilot who flew this the day before the explosion even came forward and said this is this don't sound right and a lot of people in the NTSB weren't agreeing with what they were putting out and what really sparked the controversy is like I said when the CIA came out with this totally not making sense cartoony you know illustration of how the flight went down just to basically please everybody a lot of people came out and said that doesn't make sense. Okay, now you have people actually going to radar reports. Now you you have people that's really and you, this is the NTSB who are coming out with concrete evidence. And back then, like today, if there was an airliner crash, God forbid, the NTSB would come and basically FBI would have no jurisdiction. Back then, they took over and that's what happened. So, they started researching radar transcripts and basically found out that wait a minute there's something more to this not only debris that they caught shrapnel you know on radar and also the the amount of explosive residue on the seats and where rows 15 where this thing split apart is not making sense and it's not very adapting to the story of some kind of Mid tank fuel tank exploding. Well, there's James San, actually James Sanders. His wife worked for TWA, and he's actually the author of the book, The Downing of the TWA Flight 800. He was able um, to get um, somebody passed on to him two pieces of cloth that belonged to um, some of the seats from the wreckage, and it had residue of explosive. Ex- explosive. So he took that to a private lab. Um, incognito and had it tested and it came back positive what he did as well was and he made the mistake of giving it to cb abc he gave it no he gave it to cbs cbs was going to do a spread on the findings and basically wanted to let it be known fbi got wind of this private investigation that was going on behind their backs and ended up going to cbs and taking back that piece of fabric i mean this evidence would have blown everything out the water and they were basically shutting up a lot of people and people couldn't talk like i said they had an inquiry investigation of this and had a whole court proceedings on the downing of this flight 670 witnesses did not get to testify they basically told them that they seen nothing and we are talking about people here with significant stature these aren't drunks these are people who actually you know generals these are people who are actually and not only that people who are on other flights who've seen this for their own eyes weren't allowed to testify on top of all the evidence pointing to this explosion now we have the director of 
the FBI, which is James Kallstrom. Oh, during, this, this during, guy was dirty. Oh, absolutely. He actually took a piece of that cloth as well exactly. and kept it for himself, but there was nothing that was done to him. This that- guy was dirty, okay? This guy is the one you see on the news. He's the director of the FBI at the time and was basically – he. It's on you. You can look it up saying that the witnesses did not see any missile. Well, all, all in accounts to him, the 670 some eyewitnesses that wanted to testify during these hearings or that, you know, that wanted to come forward. He was told that nobody is allowed to speak. Not only that, we have a U.S. Navy master chief that was on the USS trapping at the time who admitted that it was actually shot down. But and he wanted to testify, but he was also told he cannot speak also because of concerns over his pension and he didn't want to lose that well, at the time. That's the, that's the whole case. It, it, it's basically bribery at that point. We're talking about a lot of officials. That's why, you know, I don't knock the NTSB at during this one incident because they were actually kept out. And they were trying to do their job. That's why today you have those six whistleblowers who are coming clean. Back then they were swore to secrecy not to talk about any investigations. That's why you see stuff like, you know, Boston bombings going on today. Or you see, you know, the shooting at that naval shipyard and they're releasing suspects information within 24 hours. That is unheard of. You do not do that during an, a pending or a live investigation. You do not do that. And that's why you see stuff like this, and you're like, why are they even giving out the the details of the suspect's name? All this, it's it's not. It's all hogwash at this point. Getting back to 800 and what they're trying to feed us, that a spark ignited the fuel tank. A lot of and, you know TWA pilots and Boeing's own scientists said that is highly unlikely. Okay, because during takeoff, that center tank is supposed to be free of clear of any gas it stores water as well so the spark that was tested that would ignite this would be 75 joules people are asking how much electricity is 75 joules of a spark if you ever walked and touched the doorknob and got shocked that is 75 joules of electricity so this is what sparked this however the fbi and cia does not have an ignition source are you hearing me they don't know where this spark came from okay you, you should know. They're already concluding that this is what happens unless, but they can't point to the specific wire or anything. Okay, that's out the water. Now let's go to the eyewitness testimony. You have Paul, all right, Angelides, right, who have actually witnessed this. And this is a credible witness who've seen what actually happened. And he's one among 670 people who witnessed something very strange. So let's listen to his testimony. And mind you, it's a little bit, you know, we're talking about 1996 technology. That wasn't that long ago, Mike. It wasn't, but look how fast (laughs) we advanced to clean stuff up. So let's go to his report. And traveling uh, with increasing speed. And uh, traversed and went went outbound uh, until we got to uh, about 10 degrees or so above the horizon. I lost track of it for... Uh, about a second or two in between, I saw a flash. Then I saw another flash, which was uh, appeared to come up from the horizon. All of that action eventually uh, culminated in a huge fireball, uh, a yellow fireball. And that fireball just dropped into the ocean like a rock and left a black smoke trail on its way down. Into, uh, to the horizon. I called the uh, U.S. Coast Guard. I got the Merchant's Coast Guard station. I told them my name, that I just witnessed a fire and explosion uh, offshore, gave them my position. And I was immediately told that that was the Air National Guard firing flare tonight. And I said, nope, this wasn't a flare. This was, this looked like somebody shot themselves in the foot. Six months went by and I'm watching TV and they're way off the mark. Uh, I called them up. I said, you need to send a technical expert out to talk to me. i got a lot of things I can tell you about, folks. And they seem to be missing that there. This plane was not just flying along and then exploded. I didn't even know that plane was out there. When long before, I see an object miles and miles away, close to the beach, heading outbound. There was clearly a cause and effect there. And he said, oh, do you want to change your story? And I, I got the impression that he was you know, being a little hostile. Uh, and, and I said, no, I just really uh, think you guys are way off the mark with your investigation and that 
you need to send some, some technical expert to talk to me. Because uh, my impression of the, the three that came out to my home is that they were more of a screening committee. They weren't really investigating uh, in detail any of the technical merits of what I may have seen. So, um, uh, but of course I never heard from the FBI. That bore no resemblance whatsoever to what I saw. Nobody has said, is this what, what you saw? Did they show me the mug book? No. But if they asked me, it didn't resemble it in any way. Now, Paul is one of many uh, people who have seen, you know, and have eyewitness accounts to what actually happened. Now, these are people that who have never met, you know, different, you know, different people, but they have come to the same conclusion of what they've seen. A lot of the stuff that these people have said, you know, and the testimony that they gave did not coincide with what which was actually put out there. Well, obviously, he was talking about six months later when he seen that CIA video that was put out for propaganda. That was nothing of what he's seen. And it put that, compile that on top of not being able to testify. Everything was basically BS at that point. So this is why I made an inquiry. So now let's get to another credible witness. And this is Master Chief Dwight Brumley, who also, and it's the retired Navy guy who explains as well what he saw. In fact, whatever I saw, whatever the, whatever the flare-like object in fact was, was moving with, in the same direction as the U.S. airplane. It appeared to be climbing up and moving parallel with the U.S. airplane. And the information that I have on the U.S. airplane is it was traveling north, northeast. Uh, the, the object that they had, as if I, they animated as if, as if I was looking out the window, was almost like it's crossing in front of the plane from left to right, going away from me. And that's not in fact what I saw. That wasn't even, even close to being an accurate representation of what I saw. It really stood out, the fact that here I am, I'm 25 years in the Navy, 25 and a half years, was an electronic warfare technician, qualified CIC watch officer, uh, surface warfare qualified, been stationed on an aircraft carrier, Stood watch on it in an aircraft carrier as, as an assistant TAO. I understand relative motion, relative bearing, uh, and I figured I was would have been a good witness, and probably probably the only witness with that level of knowledge and expertise looking down on what became TWA 800. And I was just very very surprised. And to this day, still nobody has come and talked to me. All right. See. Very credible witness. I can go on and on and on through 670, but we don't have time to do that. All right. Now let's get back to what was going on there and the other the other thing. All right. Obviously, I was just going to say to that remark was neither did the government. <laughs> oh, exactly. All right. During that time, like I said, Flight 800's path was going to fly through this corridor of congested. Pla it's JFK Airport. And it also was going to skim or skirt a U.S. military zone that was off-bound towards the south. All right, it is known that military were doing testing at this time. Radar hits do put several U.S. Navy vessels within that area, very, very close to where this got shot down. I'm saying shot down because I'm going to come up to the evidence right now and prove my case. Radar reports also picks up after the shooting down of Flight 800, we have U.S. Navy vessels going in the opposite direction at 13 knots, speeding away. Now, you would think, like I said, Coast Guard came to the rescue, not the Navy. They turned around and went the opposite way. Makes you wonder, they didn't come it? the next day. They went the opposite way. A lot of witnesses reported either it was two missile strikes or one. CIA, have, have you believed that the plane, you know, got exploded from the bottom and nose fell off and did a steep climb, and this is where you get the two fireballs. However, radar reports also show that this plate went on an arc all the way down. It did not climb. Also, the projectiles that got shot off was at supersonic speeds, meaning something struck this really big. The reason for the split in the aircraft, because not that the missile hit it, it's because of 
this proximity explosion. There's missiles that we all know explodes in a proximity to its target. Take, for example, a nuclear bomb that explodes and detonates like two, 20 miles above. So the shock wave pushes down and it's a bigger effect. The military is known and was at that area shooting missiles and testing it. Could it be that they messed up? Well, the Navy did admit that there were do there was bomb sniffing dogs there because they were doing a, a some kind of well a- that that was already that was a whole different flight okay when they found the thing about that all right but getting back to the explosion and the evidence if you were listening to the data flight recorder going back to air traffic control you heard one flight described that he seen this light coming at him. He thought it was a landing light, but it was speeding towards him and forced him to turn on his landing approach lights. All right. Then you seen the helicopter pilot who said he's seen traces of lights shoot up as well as other witnesses seeing this and fleeing the scene. The reports of what was caught on the chairs were explosive residue and the type of explosives was from a military ordnance type of missile like you said Lindsay, this wasn't on the plane this was something they spill out to to get this to make it fit on why would this be not there? to mention real quick um there was also eyewitness testimony that in the hangar when they were you know recovering all the wreckage and you know assessing the damage there was a F- navy there that had hazmat suits on exactly you know and what was the reason for that not only that, the Navy, when it was coming to uh, acquire and look for the flight data recorders, were very sketchy about it and said they couldn't fi- find anything. All right, They sent out a lot of vessels. However, you had a lot of shipping and private-owned vessels saying they kept hearing this ping on radar. You know, all flight data recorder box transmit on their transponders, and it's a beacon to be found. So they played that story. They couldn't find it. And when a privateer was going to go down and get it, this is when they jumped to action and finally found it. However, a lot of the recordings were missing a lot of time into it. We don't know what really happened after they got the okay for the climbing on what they seen. There's a lot of reports that they actually said they had an explosion in front of them before that bottom one hit them. You know, so basically they climbed. Whatever they were testing, as you put it together, a missile coming from the United States Navy, and you know they would protect them because we do not want to dishonor our men and women in uniform. Never. Especially during that time when we had this 9-11 bombing. We want to keep them looking proud. I think accidentally, accidentally, what? Accidentally got caught in the wrong place at the wrong time and hit. 800 and the one that exploded under wasn't a direct hit it was an abort to abort the missile that's why you get the concussion that split that plane and in, in half basically and separate the nose cone not because of a direct strike but because of the shock wave itself and scattered debris so far out that radar did catch it still love our military like i said so you possibly think that it was an accident it was an accident of an accident wrong place at the wrong time got covered up and made swept under the rug and just made it even so worse the conclusion is possibly that the u.s navy was testing the missiles and then it locked on yes like i said there were in a no flight zone and as a corridor but sad to say but that's what i think everybody's entitled for their own opinion so remember if you're out there swimming in the oceans of new york and find wreckage of twa flight 800 give it back to the government because it might just send you right back here into the paranormal beyond good night everybody Society.com. You're going to believe.
Join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight, for the paranormal and beyond. Join host Michael Knight and Lindsay Knight as they investigate the unexplained and most controversial mysteries of the world. The paranormal and beyond, where the paranormal lives on and conspiracies exposed. The paranormal and beyond, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight. Brought to you by Knight's Paranormal Research Society. She packed my bags last night, we fly Zero hour, 9 a.m. And I'm gonna be high as a kite by then. didn't find any part of the airplane that indicated a mechanical failure. The explosive forces came from outside the airplane, not the center fuel tank. The FBI did all the interviewing of eyewitnesses. No witness was ever allowed to testify. For that kind of cover-up to be tolerated, it makes me fighting mad. <laughs> Broadcasting live from the dark and cold dungeons deep beneath the KLAV studios in Las Vegas, Nevada. Prepare yourselves to be taken away into another dimension as we now have control over your thoughts, fears, and perspective of the unexplained world you dare not speak of. With your hosts, Lindsay Knight and Michael Knight. Ladies and gentlemen, we now open the gates to the paranormal and beyond. 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 Broadcasting live from the KLAV studios in Las Vegas, Nevada, this is the Paranormal and Beyond. In the evening of July 17, 1996, TWA Flight 800 carrying a total of 212 passengers, including 18 crew members, was on its routine flight to Paris, were on takeoff and only 11 minutes into its climb, exploded in midair and killing all 230 souls aboard. As the government of the United States, despite the embarrassment of having been caught in rigging court lab tests and lying in all of its reports, still to this day, they officially blame the disaster solely to a spark in the center fuel tank while insisting that the 670 eyewitnesses who saw a missile hit the jumbo jet were all delusional. When we return, what really happened to Flight 800? And also, what is the government so desperately trying to hide? In a moment, the story, the investigation, the eyewitness reports, the evidence, and the conspiracy when we return right here on the Talk of Las Vegas, KLAV 1230 AM. Your ticket to the unknown is at nightsparanormalresearchsociety.com. UFOs, ghosts, aliens, hauntings. Mysterious places and more can be found at Knights Paranormal Research Society.com. Knights with a K Paranormal Research Society.com. Based out of Las Vegas, Nevada, Knights Paranormal Research Society is owned and operated by the renowned brother and sister. All right, welcome back to this brand new edition of the Paranormal Beyond. But first, be sure to check us out at Knights Paranormal Research Society.com where you can link up to all the past shows by simply clicking on that archive link above. That's Knights Paranormal Research Society.com. Interested in acting? We'll start acting by logging on to Hollywood Bound Acting Academy.com. Once again, that's Hollywood Bound Acting Academy. Dot com. Special shout out to all those listening to us online through the KLAV 1230am.com website and all those driving around in the Vegas Valley listening to us on your stereos. 
All right, we got a very, very sort of like tragic show. Once again, another cover up. And so blatantly in the face of people, we're going to get into uh, TWA Flight 800 and everything about it. To this day, you have a lot of people who's pointing at conspiracies. I don't think it's a conspiracy due to all the information out there. How are you doing, Lindsay? I'm well, thank you. And I, you know, I can't wait to do this story because I, I pretty much want to blow the cover on well, what really happened on this TWA Flight 800. Well, that's what we do. Uh, the evidence alone is compelling. Hey, Oksana, uh, lifeguard 800 heavy, 8,200 climbing, 11,000. We just saw an explosion out here, it's going to be 507. Can't leave 507, I'm sorry, I missed it. Uh, you out of 18, did you say something else? We just saw an explosion of the air, it's about 16,000 feet or something like that, it just went down to the water. Most of the urges are doing that, I could confirm that out of my, uh, at, uh, my 9 o'clock position, we just had an ex looked like an explosion out there about 5 miles away, 6 miles away. CWA 800 center. CWA 800 center. I think that was him. I think so. On July 17, 1996, TWA Flight 800 exploded in the sky. A missile or some kind of streaking object was seen in the sky at the same time TWA Flight 800 exploded. I saw an object rise out of the ocean. It was moving very rapidly. And then it started climbing, passing my altitude, and the explosion. And the very next day, the FBI came to talk to me and said, you did not see that, you saw nothing. The TWA Flight 800 in-flight breakup was initiated by a fuel air explosion in the center wing tank. 